This episode is brought to you by Skinny Pop Popcorn. Perfectly popped, endlessly delicious. Oh, so light and crunchy. Skinny Pop Original Popcorn is the snack you've been searching for. Made with just three simple ingredients, popcorn kernels, sunflower oil, and salt. Snacking never felt or tasted so good. Perfectly popped, endlessly delicious. Give yourself permission to snack and pick up Skinny Pop Original Popcorn today. No, sex and intimacy is not the same. I always say you can have intimacy without sex and you can have sex without intimacy. The way I I define this is sex is something you do. Intimacy is how you do it. And for me, intimacy is the depth of human experience. So it's about how deep do you go into into anything in your life. You're listening to Make Some Noise Podcast, episode number 642 with guest Magda Kay. Welcome to Make Some Noise Podcast, your guide for strategies, tools, and insight to empower yourself. I'm your host, Andrea Owen, global speaker, entrepreneur, life coach since 2007, and author of three books that have been translated into 18 languages and are available in 22 countries. Each week, I'll bring you a guest or a lesson that will help you maximize unshakable confidence, master resilience, and make some noise in your life. You ready? Let's go. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the podcast. I'm so glad that you're here with me today. We have another amazing guest. I cannot wait to introduce you. And I liked her so much and felt like we didn't get through everything I wanted to ask her that I've invited her to come back in January to to have part two of the conversation. So you're going to hear about her in just a second. But before we jump into it, I wanted to let you know that on Black Friday... I'm opening up registration, early bird registration for my Daring Way retreat that's going to be here at my house early in February or or sorry, early in the year 2025. So at the end of February, it's going to be a cozy, intimate gathering here at my house in Greensboro, North Carolina. So for those of you that might be wondering, like, what what do you learn in the curriculum? What am I going to walk away with? I really invite you to go and read the page. I go into detail about what your key takeaways are. It's andreaowen.com slash retreat, but I'm just going to run through a few of them real quick. A lot of what you learn in the curriculum is around building resilience, understanding the steps to develop the strength to navigate any of life's challenges with grace and courage instead of going to the places that you usually go to around people pleasing or isolating or pushing back or getting defensive, just not dealing with it at all. It is developing better coping skills. At the end of the day, it's developing coping skills that help you build better relationships, build more self-confidence, really show up as the person that you want to with courage and connection and insight. You'll have more empowered decision-making. And all of this is science-based, based on Brene Brown's research over the last almost 20 years now. And it is a curriculum and strategy, really, methodology that I wholeheartedly believe in because I still use it in my life. I've been certified to facilitate this for about 10 years. It's been more than 10 years. This summer, it was 10 years. So obviously, I'm an evangelist. But head on over to andreaowen.com slash retreat. Everything is there, all of the information. And if you're on the fence, let's book a call. It's no cost. Let's get on the call for 20-ish minutes you can do a gut check. You can tell me your specific circumstances, what your goals are, and I can tell you if this will help you. I'm not going to hard sell you on it. If I think it can help you, I will tell you exactly how I think it can help you. And also the retreat cost comes with two one-on-ones with me so that you will walk away and go back into your life knowing how to implement and apply what you learned in your unique scenario and circumstances. Okay. AndreaOwen.com slash retreat. Shifting gears, let me tell you about today's guest. Magda Kay, an intimacy expert, tantra teacher, and conscious relating coach, author and founder of The School of Intimacy, is on a mission to help people access their deepest desires and ability to create transformative intimacy in their lives. So without further ado, here is Magda. Magda, thank you so much for being here. Oh, I'm excited. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited. And I I mentioned before we started that I'm both personally and professionally 
excited to have you on because this is this is an area that I have. I'm in an, an era of my life where it's something that I am focusing on, and and like, what does this look like for me? And so I'm I'm excited in that regard too. And so I want to start. Can we like let's start from the very beginning and like basics. So when when someone says intimacy, I think that many people think that that is strictly about sex and like mm-hmm. intercourse and having a sexual relationship with someone. Are those the same thing or how do you define intimacy? So I'm really happy that this is where we're starting because indeed, no, sex and intimacy is not the same. I always say you can have intimacy without sex and you can have sex without intimacy. It's usually called bad sex. Yeah. But I think we've all had that. Yes, exactly. Exactly. So the way I I define this is sex is something you do. Mm -hmm. Intimacy is how you do it. Okay, gotcha. And for me, intimacy is the depth of human experience. So it's about how deep do you go into, into anything in your life. So it's for everything, not just sexual things. So let's say you are very happy. How happy can you be? How much do you allow yourself just to feel the joy and that childlike excitement about something? Or do you censor yourself? If you're sad, How much are you allowing yourself to feel that sadness? Because, you know, we have a tendency of maybe allowing certain emotions, but then censoring some others. And so it's all about, can I just be more present? Can I be more open? Can I really, truly feel what is happening right now? And so this is intimacy. And this is something that you want to be bringing into all of your relationships, the relationship with yourself, and then of course, the bedroom. But these are two different things. And I feel... You know, we were chatting about this before we we started recording with all of the censorship online. Mm-hmm. Of course, we use the word intimacy as the synonym for sexuality. And then in our normal vocabulary, we do the same. Like notice I would say, oh, we were intimate last night, implying mm-hmm. we had sex. And so because we use these words as synonyms in our mind, it's one and the same. And as long as you treat it as one and the same, you're actually missing on what intimacy truly is. And you're missing on the tools that could bring up more intimacy. So I think this is essential for people to separate the two to the point that these two are totally not related. If you think of this, yeah, we want to bring them together, but it's just totally different concepts. I love the way that you explained intimacy. And when you were saying that, my first thought was, I thought about my own life and I'm like, oh, I think this is the thing that many people are drawn to me for because I am intimate with my life. Like I, (laughs) I think deeply, I feel deeply. And that last part, the feeling deeply part for anyone listening, who's been told you're too sensitive, you're too emotional. Like that's how, in the way you described it, that's how I look about, look at being intimate with your own life, being intimate with your own feelings and experiences. And I know for me, that has been a turnoff for some people. They don't, they don't like that about me. And my guess is like, okay, well, if you don't like it about me, you definitely don't like it about yourself. Like you're, you're scared of it. It's just, it's a frontier that's difficult for them. Not making those people bad or wrong. It's just intimacy, whether you're doing it by yourself in your own life or with another person, it's a lot, it's impactful and, and takes a lot of trust of another person, trust of yourself. And I, I want to ask you too, I know that like part of your mission is to help people access their their deepest desires to be able to transform their lives to be more intimate. So can you can you speak about like where do you even start with these people? The most important shift for anyone to make. And I'm sure you'll agree and you you'll probably be like, yep, yep. Simply for people, I would say start closing your eyes and going within. And just talk to yourself. Yeah, like a crazy person. Talk to yourself. I feel like all of the answers we're looking for, they're inside of us. It's just we we don't have this relationship with self. We, we don't yeah. feel ourselves. We don't hear our you know intuitive voice. And so we go outside, right? And we outsource everything. We ask yeah. our partner, our father, our mother, our friends, Google. our coach. Mm-hmm. And, and oh, Google, yes. And look, I love doing my Oracle cards, but it's another form of outsourcing my power, really, because I, I don't trust myself. And really what it takes is to just close your eyes, take a moment of silence and start like checking your body from the inside and asking yourself questions. 
and start working on that relationship until you get to the point where you're getting those insights from your body immediately. Like mm -hmm. for me, unless you do that, I, I will never believe you that you are living your dream life unless you do that, because I'll challenge you that these are not your dreams, because unless yeah. you source them from within, I doubt that they are yours. So for me, this is the most important shift. So I'll take my clients, you know, I'll be like, okay, let's do a little practice. Let's close your eyes, make sure you're comfortable. And then I have different kind of tools that I work with, but I really like seeing what I do. I like going down into the genital space, for example, mm -hmm. and have my clients talk to their genitals, to their sex center, because this is not just about sex. Our sex center is actually responsible for all pleasure in life. Yeah. Again, not just sexual, but all pleasure. So, you know, the fun, the, the joy that we experience that so many of us are disconnected from. So I'll just ask them, talk to your genitals, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. see what they have to say. So, so for me, this is the first step for anyone. Okay. Is this what, is that, are we on the track is this a good segue for you to talk about power centers because i know that's part yes. of the work that you do okay so can say more about power centers yes yeah, so so i just mentioned one of them so power centers the, what i have identified through my life so it's not something i learned in a book or any school it's my experience i noticed that very often when i want to connect with my inner voice it's not always easy because that voice kind of changes its mind and you're like, okay, Pickle what's happening? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like, exactly. Well, you just wanted that. Now you want this. What the heck? It's kind of hard to follow. And what I realized is that it's not very easy for us to connect to, you know, what some people call like this higher self. Mm -hmm. We connect in a way to our ego. But I felt that there are four distinct voices inside of us that link to four different areas of our lives, four different types of needs. And it's easier to talk to those power centers instead of just kind of a general voice inside of you. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's like much clearer when I know that, okay, it's kind of like, okay, imagine you have a company and you have your departments. And if you want to speak about marketing, you, you speak to the head of the marketing, right? If you want sales, you speak to someone who's for the sales instead of one person for everything. Right. So what these four centers are is one is exactly the sex center. Then we have the gut, mm -hmm. then the heart and the head. And what's interesting about all of them, like I said, is that they are linked to different needs. So the sex center, which is our genitals, it's about pleasure, all pleasure in life. And of course, sexual as well. Mm -hmm. Your gut is about your safety because of course, we know we have this instinct in us yes. to just like be safe. Don't go there. Don't talk to this person. The heart is about love and connection. And then the head, it's a bit of like a manager who has the goals. And it just needs to make sure that everything makes sense, that the way we move through life is congruent. Like we, we you know, we love being consistent, right? So that's mm -hmm. what the head is for. And so ideally, like, I would recommend to every person to get to know these four voices. And so when you are being the crazy person talking to yourself, mm -hmm. just talk to a different part of yourself. So, so now you're not just crazy. You're also schizophrenic. <laughs> a little bit, multiple personality. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I like that. It, it actually seems to coincide with, I'm, I'm sort of eyeball deep in, um, have you heard of internal family systems, IFS? Yes. 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 So, so it's, it's, yeah, there it sounds like it would work well with that and everything. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I, I think a lot of people, and I would that's that's I said. I assume the these would be your tools as well. It's the concept of having different parts inside of you, right? Yes. That you're like mm -hmm. a combination of different personalities. H hence, I'm saying to all of my clients, please be schizophrenic. Like, just assume yes. there are different people living in you. Get to know them. Work with them. That's the best solution, I think. <laughs> Yeah, well, you it's, agree? It's, I love it because, I, and I, I really like, well, the book is called No Bad Parts. If, if we can drop it in the show notes, but one of the things I love about it is that I think it it's universal. And even those four power centers that you talked about, because I tell people, anytime you hear yourself say, there's a part of me that doesn't want to talk about that. There's a part of me that really wants to do this. That's what I want to know about. And I'm like, tell me about that. Tell me more about that part of you. How well do you, how, how well do you listen to that part of you? What do you think that that part of you is trying, is after? What do they want? What are they afraid of? So that's why I love anyone that, that 
that can point to different. And I love that you made the distinction between like your sex center, which is that in your um, work, is that the space of creativity or is it in your gut? So creativity for me will be the sex center. So you do. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so the way I feel my gut is like mo okay, I, I have felt my gut in two ways. One mm-hmm. was when I was about to do something that wasn't good for me. And it would be like I could feel my gut saying, Don't do it, do not do it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so like protecting me. But I'll tell you just like personally, for about two years, anytime I would do this meditation for myself and I would ask my God, okay, is there anything you want to tell me? My God would always tell me, take risks. Hmm. I was like, okay, okay. I'm not taking enough risks in my life. So, so as you can see, it's not just about only wanting to keep you safe. It basically balances the safety, right? And I'm like, okay, clearly I'm having too much safety in my life. So I'm like, how can I be more bold in my life. Okay. Do I need to pitch myself somewhere? Do I need to ask someone out? Right. Do I need to like, now I sign up for acting classes. That is definitely outside of my comfort zone. But it's funny because my God is kind of pushing me. It's like, do new things. Like if you just do the things you're good at and that you're used to, like magic will not happen. So my God is pushing me to step outside of my comfort zone. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's interesting too, that it it rests right in between your heart and your like your sex power center too. Interesting. Okay. I love that. When you take a quick ad break and when we get back, I want to ask you more specifically around love and relationships. We'll be right back. My dad works in B2B marketing. He came by my school for career day and said he was a big row ass man. Then he told everyone how much he loved calculating his return on ad spend. My friends still laugh at me to this day. Not everyone gets B2B, but with LinkedIn, you'll be able to reach people who do. Get $100 credit on your next ad campaign. Go to linkedin.com slash campaign to claim your credit. That's linkedin.com slash campaign. Terms and conditions apply. LinkedIn, the place to be, to be. Are you a parent in need of a laugh and a little escape? Look no further. Parenting is a Joke is the podcast you've been waiting for. Hey, I'm Ophira Eisenberg. I'm a stand-up comic and parent. And each week I chat with one of my top comedian pals who, just like you, are juggling careers, busy lives and schedules, and raising a family. You can expect candid stories, hilarious mishaps that happen on stage and at home, and just a lot of laughs. There's no expert advice here. Well, actually, sometimes a good idea does sneak its way in, but mostly just pure, relatable fun to remind you that we're all in this parenting adventure together. New episodes of Parenting is a Joke drop every Tuesday, so tune in, get ready to laugh, unwind, and maybe even feel a little bit better about your own parenting. Because sometimes that's exactly what your therapist, pediatrician, and bartender ordered. (laughs) Subscribe now on your favorite podcast platform. Lynn, this time of year, parenting can be such a fluster clux. You've come to the right place. I'm Lynn Lyons, and I've been treating anxious families for over 30 years. I'm Lynn's sister-in-law and co-host Robin Hudson. Join us for Fluster Clux, a podcast for parents who worry. Wait, that's everybody. Yeah, these last few years have felt like one long anxiety attack for so many. Why do you think parents are always surprised that a podcast about anxiety relates to them, even if no one in their house has an anxiety disorder? Well, worry is human. Everyone does it. And anxiety shows up when we face uncertainty. All the parenting tips you've taught me have been essential. I love to break it down into skills we need to manage worry in our families. We've covered so many topics, depression, burnout, meltdowns, perfectionism. Don't forget scary mothers-in-law. Right, but of course that's not my mother-in-law. Because that's my mother. And a listener. As a psychotherapist, I like to teach parents and kids how to respond to everyday moments in healthy ways. Managing anxiety really can be taught. It really can. And I'll even tell you what to say. We talk about serious stuff, but without being too serious. Anxiety wants everything serious. Anxiety doesn't stand a chance when we're laughing, even about the tough stuff. Tell us what are the the sort of most common or main mistakes that people of all genders make that lead to losing relationships and having relationships end and 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 how can how can people work on on that? In my opinion, the number one mistake 
is just the mindset. And it's this assumption that you don't have to do anything, that it's Uh just natural, that it's just an instinct to be together and that's it. I find it so puzzling, to be honest, because like if you think of it, okay, when you get a new phone or like any new electronic device, I know most of us don't actually read the manual, but at least you kind of check it, right? You're not like, I don't expect myself to just know how to use like, I don't know, a new dishwasher. Like I, right. I need to kind of learn or at how least it we works. Google the model number, yeah, you know, like, <laughs> exactly. you do, you do at least some basic research to know how to use it. Mm-hmm. And yet with human beings, we think we don't need to do that. I mean, uh, human beings are way more complex than the latest iPhone or a dishwasher. Mm-hmm. You know, we have a lot of buttons you can press and the consequences are much more serious. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> so so unfortunately, you know, we do live in in the type of a society that just believes that you need to study chemistry and physics and history, but, oh, we don't have to study relationships. We don't have to study personal development. We don't Mm -hmm. have to study sexuality. And so we grow up thinking that you don't have to learn about this. And there's so much to learn. Like, it is ridiculous how much there is. You can have a full, like, five-year degree in tantra and conscious relationships. And trust me, you could go into PhD because there is so much. So for me, the main mistake is just assuming that, oh, we love each other. We desire each other. And so it's going to stay like this. Mm -hmm. In science, there is this, uh, I guess I I would say phenomenon called entropy. And what entropy means is that any system in nature is designed to fall apart. Mm -hmm. So if you just leave any, any system, after a while, it's going to just disappear. Uh, you can think of a human body, right? Like, unless you take care of yourself, you're going to die. Like, at the minimum, we got to eat, right? We got to breathe. And then it's all of these things we're doing. You know, all of the biohacking is about how can we keep the system from falling apart, right? So we don't age as fat, so we can, you know, live longer. Um, in a way, medicine is all about this. Okay, take another example with the car, right? You have a car. Like, you buy it, it works perfectly, but after 10 years, it does it. You know, just like, Every system is designed to fall apart. A relationship is a system. And so it's designed to fall apart. So from the moment you get into a relationship, there is ex- there are all of these external forces that are pulling it apart. And the only thing that can stop entropy from happening is if you keep injecting energy into the system. Mm. We know it in all, like in science, we know this and we use this, right? Again, like I said, with our looks and our health, that's what we do. That's why we go see doctors. That's why we do all biohacking. We use creams, et cetera, because we try to add energy in different forms to keep our system as in our body. Maintaining it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so we have to be doing this with the relationship. It doesn't matter how good it was at the beginning. It doesn't matter how compatible you are. It doesn't matter how much you desire each other. Unless you keep injecting energy, meaning you keep investing in this relationship, eventually it will die. Mm -hmm. You can never be passive about it. And I just like, I don't know, sometimes I feel like like I get comments on YouTube, people like fighting on this. And I'm like, well, is this working for you? Yeah. Tell (laughs) me if it is. Is this? (laughs) Yeah. That person should have their own YouTube channel then if if it's the other way is is working for them. (laughs) That's interesting. It, It reminds me of and and my audience knows this. They might not know the last part though. I was mentioning that I I la- last year I left a very long relationship and and marriage, and you know it's been about eighteen months since that ended, and and now I'm dating again, and and I I'm entering these new relationships. Um, you know, especially if it it you know goes on for more than one or two dates, and I and I'm asking the questions. It's like, what are you what are you looking for? And and I think. A lot of this has just come with age and being married two different times where I did not do this previously. Previously, it was like, do I like you? Yes. Do you do you like me? Yes. Okay, let's do this and we'll figure it out as we it's go. Same with me. I'm like, oh my God, I get butterflies. I'm attracted oh, yeah, to yeah, you. Yeah. Oh, this let's is enough. Get married. This is enough. Yes. I, I'm obsessed <laughs> with you, which I'm not saying that's bad. And I still do that part. But now I'm like, what are you looking for? What do you want? 
what are your, um, what are your red flags? And you know, one of my favorite questions is what would your exes say about you? What were the things that they complained about? Cause I'll tell you what mine said and it's a pattern. I'm not going to lie. Like, <laughs> I, I, I come with my own baggage and I think it's, to me, it's so refreshing to have those conversations and also to know that about ourselves. Like this is just comes with age and wisdom. And I don't think that you need to be 49. Like I am in order to do that. I think that you can do this even starting in your twenties. Like when you start to to learn your own patterns. It's like, talk about them. Trust me, everyone. Listen to me when I tell you. <laughs> if, you will be saying, if you end up in a relationship, and I, and I think people can do this even if they've been in a relationship for a long time, like those people that are listening, like you might want to ask your partner the question, if you had to, st- if we had to start all over, like if this was our first date, what would you, what conversations should, should we be having at this stage? Like what, what, what would you say that you're looking for? And then you can run with that in your own relationship. I just, anyway, I get up on my soapbox about this because I'm finding it so much more of a relief to know from the beginning, like, why is everybody here? What are your expectations? Even yes. just that, that. So I'm the same. And, and I think it is the matter of age there's a few people who came to me, they wanted to work with me and they were in their early twenties. And I was like, look, I appreciate you asking these questions, but it's like, you are meant to go through life. Like, yeah. like, like there has to be a phase when you just date someone because of the butterflies in your stomach. Sure. Like, I don't want to take this away from you, but you know, and at different age, it will come for different people. But like, yes, there is a moment when you're like, okay, butterflies felt good. And then they didn't. <laughs> They, they will only take you so far. I think they're great to have. And I do think, I just want to say this one last thing before I ask you another question. I do think that you can have both. I think that you can have butterflies and also have like the, the smart, pragmatic, intentional, conscious conversations that lead to something really beautiful. Okay. Shifting gears slightly, because I want you to talk to us about Tantra. <laughs> I, I, I think that if there are people listening who have heard it, I, my guess is that they're probably like me. And the only thing that they really know about it is like what Sting and his wife, Trudy, used to talk about. I don't even know if people <laughs> where they would have sex for like nine hours. Yes, and, yes, yes. And <laughs> I think the misconception is, is like, that's mostly what it is. It's just like these hours and hours long marathon intercourse moments. And it's like, what, what is Tantra? Like, give us, give us the one, two, threes. So, Okay. Tantra actually is a spiritual path for Mm -hmm. enlightenment. In that regards, it's actually very, very similar to yoga, only that yoga was created for men and only for one caste and was very exclusive, right? As in like, you, you could, you couldn't really get into it. Like women couldn't, couldn't practice yoga. And it's kind of funny these days how it's mostly women doing yoga and not realizing the history of yoga, which was very patriarchal, but that's a different story. Yeah. So Tantra was created in a way as a response to this. So Tantra was for everyone. And Tantra was kind of like, you know, it was this shocking path, kind of like rebellious spiritual path, because they included everything that was considered like inappropriate. So women could practice Tantra. There was place for sex, for meat, for some alcohol. All the castes were allowed to practice it. So it's like really, you know, shocking for the times, but essentially it is a spiritual path. And there is part of Tantra that includes sexuality, but there's also a tantric path that has nothing to do with sex and you don't do any sexual practices. Mm -hmm. So of course, these days, when we say Tantra, we do think about sex because, you know, in, in our society where religion is well, very negative towards sexuality, right? Like sex right. is considered mostly a sin in, in most of our religions, Painful. right? You should be covering, exactly. Mm-hmm. There's all of this, all, all of this negative mindset. So I think because we are human beings and we naturally, like we all do it, duh. Um, so I think there is a natural desire to talk about it and learn about it. And so Tantra, in a way, came with that it's like, hey, we do talk about it and we actually practice this. We want to get better. And I think people really needed this. And this is why today, when you say Tantra, you do really mean conscious sexuality. And I'm perfectly okay with people limiting the definition um, because as long as it helps, you know, and it gives people the tools, I'm happy. But I think it's just good to know is that sex is just like a, a small part of a Tantra. Part of it. It's one of right? the pieces of the pie. Yes. Okay. But essentially, if you think of this in terms of sexuality, for me, what Tantra is, is is exactly what we said at the very beginning. 
Tantra is about bringing intimacy mm-hmm. into your sex life. Okay. It, it, it really is about that. I've had, and I've had, you know, it's almost 650 episodes. And I think maybe I've had two people off the top of my head that I can think of where the topic was broached maybe for five or 10 minutes. And my takeaway, and there are some people I follow on Instagram. You're, you're one of them who talk about this. And I'm very rudimentary in terms of what I know about it, but it seems to me that exactly like you just said, so it's a almost um, like intimacy up leveled, like a, the next level of intimacy. And I, I, I feel like I had one guest on years ago who talked about like, you can have tantric experiences in nature you know, oh, yes. like with the yes, trees yes, 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 and yes. Mm-hmm. yeah. And, and then she, you know, her recommendation from what I remember is like, she's like, start there rather than with another person that you're relying on their consciousness and, you know, and having it being a two way um, relationship symbiotic thing. And I thought that was interesting. Like, I felt like that was a good starting point. What are your thoughts on that? Yes, absolutely. So I, um, and I will say, you know, I used to live in a tantric community for quite a few years. What? Well, that to be fair, it was, it, it was really, it was really a sex cult. If we want to I was just going to say, like, I have a feeling this is the beginning of a cult story. Okay. It I'm still here is, for but, it. But look, I'm very, I'm very glad I was there uh, because I learned a lot and I experienced a lot. I experimented a lot. I bet. But when I was doing a lot of these practices, like, you know, a few hours a day, I was literally in a place where I would sit on the rock and I would feel the energy of the rock, which is, it, this is my element. Like we have natural connection to different natural elements so everyone mm-hmm. kind of has their own that they will feel the most for me it's earth i'm i'm, I'm okay. earth okay. and so i feel the rocks like i literally feel them i'm moved by them if i'm like under a waterfall i can cry because i just feel them you know there's this like i don't know there's this deep connection and so i totally would sit on a rock and i would feel the energy coming through my root chakra so my sex center go through my body and go into these like orgasmic waves. So mm-hmm. not not an orgasm the way we kind of understand it as like the peak. It's yep. more like a wave. It's just, you're kind of getting high on drugs, right? Yes, you're getting I, I know energy. exactly what you're talking about. I've yeah. experienced that many times. Exactly. And so I've had this like in totally like non-sexual situations. And I think this is what's so incredible because it's more about your state of being in life. And then if, if you are so open, then of course, if you're having sex with someone, you can have incredible experiences together. But if you're not open, you can't, you can't have that. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think this is what, I don't know. And I get, this is another thing that comes with age. When I was younger, I was like, tell me the five things I need to do, but what exactly do I do to get there? And you Mm -hmm. realize it's not about that. It's more of a, it's your lifestyle. It's a state of being that you develop over time. Like being open is not about, you know, I don't know, every day for five minutes, I do like a certain yoga, you know, practice. It's not that it's like, it's, it's something you develop over time. It's your approach to things, but everyone can get to this place when they're so orgasmic. So for me, this was the biggest shift when I, when I unlocked that in my body. And I didn't even know of this. Like, how can you understand something unless you feel it? It's like, you don't know yeah. what love is unless you fall in love. Right. right. And so it's, it's it. one of these things, but I'll tell you, like, like having experienced that openness, I'm just like, oh my goodness, people are so close and they don't even know what's possible. Oh, and I just wish I could open all of them. <laughs> when you were saying all of that, it reminds me of the journey of my own journey. And one of the interesting things is, uh, and I've said this a million times on my podcast, but but you don't know. So my, my father passed away in 2016. And one of the things that I did as a result of not just him passing away, but the grief that I experienced and not just the grief I experienced, but it was the experience of feeling that deeply, which I had never done before that particular emotion of grief and sorrow, is I got the word surrender tattooed on my arm in my own handwriting. As a reminder, because it was the thing that I struggled with the most of completely letting go, completely letting go of attachments, completely letting go of uh, my emotions and just like surrendering to the experience of them was something that I've struggled with my entire life. And I don't think I'm alone here. (laughs) People listening, it's like the the culture that we live in, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, one of the things that I realized, you know, however many years that was, eight years ago, is that. I 
really struggle with trust in general, trusting other people as well as self-trust. And so one of my values over the last several years has been that, and it's been kind of an aspired value, but also a journey of my own to figure out what that looks like. How do we have it? I knew that there were a lot of, um, there was a lot of mistrust that I had uh, in myself. And, you know, for people listening who are like, wow, what does that look like? Not listening to my own intuition and made major life decisions based on that is one element of me knowing that I did not trust myself and then not trusting my own resilience around things. Mm. So anyway, fast forward. And I, I, and I get up on my soapbox about this a lot with almost like every guest. And I, cause I, I'm so now I'm so passionate about it. I had a feeling a few years ago that psychedelics were psychedelic therapy more specifically was something that was going to be in my journey in order for me to get to the next level, if you will, in my own personal growth and like to get to where I was looking for and, and really like to get to where I was being called to. And so I've been, I've been doing that over the last, I don't know, six months or so. And the, the self-trust lessons I have walked away with have been profound and they have completely changed my life for the better. And one of those things is what you were saying around the ability to truly sink in and and have for lack of a better term like more tantric experiences by myself a lot of times and and truly having those experiences it was the way i describe it is this and then i'll shut up and i don't know <laughs> if i've said this on the podcast or not but it, it's the difference of of do you remember when you were a kid i don't know if what if it was a different culture where you grew up but believing in santa claus did you ever have something oh, yes, like that yes, 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 okay yes. So like there's there's a moment in time when you're a child and you truly believe in Santa Claus and no one that's it. You cannot you cannot change my mind. And then you start to age as a child and then you find out that it's your parents or your grandparents or whatever. <laughs> and you still have the Christmas magic, but and maybe you still kind of say you believe in Santa for your siblings or whatever, but you don't believe it. So the difference now in terms of my own self-trust and self-discovery and you know what we've been talking about feels like I've gone back to believing in Santa Claus in mm -hmm. my in my whole with my whole body and my whole heart. That's how much I believe in myself. That is how much I believe that and it's not just a believing, it's an integrated knowing. That's the difference. And I do not think that I could have gotten to that place 10, 15, 20 years ago. I, I don't even, I, I could have done, and I did psychedelics in my twenties. Like, you know, like, and it wasn't, I do think that I say that partly because I want people who are listening to know that if you have not gotten to the place that you wish that you were at, and maybe it's with intimacy or Tantra or self-trust or whatever it is, self-love, I'm a believer that you'll get there when you're ready and you'll get there through whatever path comes along that is right for you. This is one of the reasons I have so many different guests on my on my mm. show, Magda, because I'm like, I might not be the vehicle for you. I, somebody else might come on and say something that I've been saying for the last 11 years that I've had this podcast. And they're yeah. like, oh, Eureka, <laughs> yes, <laughs> I'll leave Santa Claus again. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm so glad. Like I, yeah. I want people to get wherever they need to go however they need to get there, but also when the time is right for them. And so anyway, I just said a lot and um, we need to take a quick ad break. <laughs> I'd love for you to respond, but we, we'll, we'll be right back. Hang on, everybody. No one told us the truth about parenthood. Why? This is the podcast everyone needed before they had kids because now that those little ones are here, whew, there is a lot to unpack. I'm Rachel Shepardota, and I am your host for the podcast, No One Told Us, where we tell the truth about parenting and let you in on all the stuff you really should have known about before having kids. I am the founder of Hey Sleepy Baby, but this podcast is so much more than sleep. We'll be diving into all the topics that you really care about and need to know while you do your best job raising those adorable, tidy humans. Our goal is to just make you feel less alone and less overwhelmed. There are so many things that no one tells us before becoming a parent, and I think that we should really pull back the curtain on becoming a first-time or second-time mom or dad to share the good, the bad, and the ugly. We'll have a little education, a little fun, and a whole lot of heart that goes into each and every episode. 
So join me and our amazing guests each week to hear us talk about what no one told us. Feel like you're the martyr in your family? You're not alone. Hey, this is Joanne. And Brie. And we're from the No Guilt Mom podcast. Brie, we talk to a lot of moms. Yeah, we sure do. And if you're a mom who has a to-do list that is so massive that you get overwhelmed and you shut down. Or if you fall into the habit of doing everything for everyone and don't know how to change it, we can help you become a No Guilt Mom. We're going to take you from family martyr to family model. That's role model so that you role model the behavior that you want to see out of your kids. You're going to go from being tired and overwhelmed to energized and guilt-free. Every week, you'll get actionable strategies that you can implement right away from the experts that we interview and from us. We also have a whole lot of fun. So check out the No Get Mom podcast everywhere you listen to your favorite shows. When it comes to raising kids, there's so much to consider. Things like, what do we feed them? When do we feed them? How do they sleep? What does it look like to raise kind kids? How does their nervous system work? How do I keep myself calm? What are my triggers? There's so much that comes into play. And we are distilling all of that information for you at Voices of Your Village podcast, where we bring experts in the field of early childhood and education and psychology and across the board so that you don't have to comb the internet for information. You get to show up and hang out and have shame-free, judgment-free conversations and insights into what it looks like to raise kind, empathetic, emotionally intelligent humans. I'm Alyssa Blask Campbell. I have a master's degree in early childhood education. I'm a mom of two, and I am walking this journey right alongside you doing this work. Come hang out with me at Voices of Your Village, and we can dive into real conversations with actionable tips. Okay, we're back. I just I climbed off my soapbox, and if you want to comment on anything that I said, yes, I, I do. But I, I do have do. more questions for you. Okay, <laughs> the floor is yours, my dear. <laughs> I I love your sharing, and thank you so much for it. So I am also still learning to trust myself in different situations. I, for example, have a story when it comes trusting money and the masculine, because when mm. I was a teenager, my father went bankrupt. So I've been on my own since I was 17. Now, I know in the US, it's pretty normal for like high school kids to like get a job and get some extra money. Not in Poland, at least not when I was growing up there. So you would normally stay with your family until like university just because we had public uh all the education was public and for free okay. so you wouldn't have to make any money and so I was definitely not ready to be on my own at 17 and there was like a year where I was the only person making any money and I was getting like some scholarships from university also for the fact that I was so poor like oh, that was gosh. the only money coming into the household and so until today I still have some stories there yeah well I am really really good single. I thrive when I'm single. And when love shows up, it kind of like really messes me up because it still plays on like this old story that I have that a man will come and save me. And like when a man comes, I'm like almost like rushing to give away all of my power to him. So I'm, I'm recognizing that right now I'm going through a process when life is like, no, no, no. And you're not going to get it until you learn the lesson. So I do agree with what you're saying. There are different paths and we get there when we are meant to get there, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, and, and like, I think it's great. Like I, I have so much respect for people doing work like you, because you allow people to plant the seeds. Like yeah. someone may listen to us and this may not do anything. And you may be thinking, oh, well, it's sort of a good episode. You're not even realizing that this information is going into your body, into your subconscious. And maybe in five years, something will happen that you will be open for because you listened to and this conversation. Mm -hmm. And exactly, this is this divine timing that I, I definitely believe in. I love that. And, and I think I, I just want to tag on to that is for people to pay attention to particular topics or particular personalities that really, that you're really drawn to, that really ignite you. And it, and it might not necessarily be that that is the person that you need to, you know, sign up for their workshops and, and things like that. But there's some element of them that 
you're drawn to. So for example, Regina Thomas Hour was on my show. I, I'll, I'll drop her link in the show notes. She's she's commonly known as Mama Gina and she's in her 60s and she's been a pioneer in, in our industry. Are you familiar with her? You're nodding your head. Oh yeah, 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 Mama yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I always thought, I just was like, I love that. And even I've told my audience, uh, so Chacha de Gregorio from the movie Grease is it plays a very small part as a, as a character in the movie. And I was always very drawn to her and, and people like her. And so, so what is the theme, you know, of, of all these women that I was always drawn to, whether they were fictional characters or whether they were experts, like it's this huge amount of confidence that not only they have, or at least I assume that they have, but they also display it for, you know, they don't hide. It's not a quiet confidence. It is an outward <laughs> confidence. So that's sort of the pattern that I I kind of took inventory of my life when I was in my 30s. And I'm like, what is it about these particular woman, women that I'm drawn to? So 10, 15 years ago, I was not ready to explore that in myself. I still had to work through through other things. So which which actually brings me to another question that I have for you in terms, you know, when we're talking about just sex in general, but also intimacy and, you know, getting to a place where you can have a tantric practice and, and just growing in general. Like we have a lot of societal taboos. You know, you were talking about your your money story and, you know, uh, stories that I think many women have of like, oh, a man's going to ride up on his white horse and save you. But <laughs> e even if it's not a societal, uh, social conditioning type of thing, sometimes it's personal barriers. What advice do you have for people or how do you help them work through that so that they can embrace their sense specifically around their sensuality and intimacy fully within themselves? Mm -hmm. So see, this links so perfectly to what you brought up about everyone experiences this healing in their time. Mm -hmm. So I, when, when I work with people, I always tell them, look, there are things that I don't yet see in you and you don't yet see in yourself. They need time to come to surface. So it's a journey. And again, this is, you know, us like rushing everyone, but I want everything today. Like, you know, yes. I'm going to sign up for one session and show me exactly all of my This is America, damn it. Yes. yes. <laughs> Give me. If not, I want a refund. And it's right. just not how it works. Again, think of yourself in terms of these parts that we discussed, right? So there are these different kind of like, little use and they are scared. They're not just going to tell you that, oh, well, I feel neglected. I feel scared because the reality is that you neglected that part of yourself for all these years. So that part doesn't trust you, doesn't trust you. So it doesn't want to tell you anything. So I like to tell people, just imagine how would you try to create a relationship if you found out you had a child that you were not present for, for like, let's say his or her first six years. And now you're trying to like connect to the child and, and build a loving relationship. Like the child doesn't trust like, you. Fuck off. Yeah. Yeah. It's like the child is not going to ask you questions and, and want to play with you right away because you're a stranger. You have to build this relationship. And because it's a child, you don't get to have a logical conversation and mm -hmm. you have to be consistently showing up. This is how we have to do the healing work. There are patterns. There are blocks. Absolutely. Everyone has them. But a lot of them are very, very hidden because they're too scared to tell you that they exist because yeah. they don't trust that you will take care of them. So they're deeply suppressed. Now, there are some that just come to surface and like sabotage our lives. And it's very obvious that, okay, I have a pattern here. Mm -hmm. So we have those obvious ones, but we have those hidden ones. And you have to understand, again, it's not a one-time thing. It's not like, you know, I, I do this practice once in my life and it's all solved. It's like going to the gym. Okay. You got to keep going for the Reps rest of your life. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so I think people need to look at it differently. It is not about healing. It is not about uncovering some taboos. It's about strengthening the relationship you have with yourself. And when you have an open, honest relationship, like think of any human being, you tell each other things, right? You'd be like, mm -hmm. hey, you know, Andra, like when you said this thing yesterday, it hurt me. Mm -hmm. I can communicate to you openly if I trust you, right? You talked about trust. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But if those like broken or scared parts in you don't trust you, they're never going to say anything. 
Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so we have to start building this relationship with ourselves. This is the only way to change anything. The only way to let go of all the inhibitions and the stories we have around sex right? It's not about the new position. This is like, you know, you, you don't have a better sex life because you suddenly try a different position or you finally try anal or a vibrator. Like toys, it's not yeah. about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's again, it's about your state. Like how open can you be? And unless you feel safe with yourself, unless you trust yourself, you will never be fully open. You're yeah. never going to go into those deep orgasmic states because you don't trust yourself. So you're going to always contract. So, so that is the most important thing. I love that you, you, your advice is to start there. And I, I just want to tag one thing onto that is everybody, this is why I talk about self-compassion all the time and self-kindness, because for so many years, I thought I could just plow my way through personal development and just like motivate and cheerlead and, and, you know, like that's on the positive end of it, but also like shit talk my way through to, you know, the parts of me that I didn't like, or that I wanted to quote unquote fix. And that is just pushing and pushing and pushing. And what I learned that, cause that wasn't working is it's more about allowing the space and by allowing it is there's, it has to be done with kindness and self-compassion and lots and lots of grace. And yes. that was counterintuitive to a, how I was raised and be kind of counterintuitive to my inherent personality because my inherent personality is a hype girl. Like, <laughs> oh, me like too. To me too. I'm like, and inspire. Oh, yeah, go, go, and like, yes, yes, yes. And do it and work hard. Totally. Yes. I am. And yeah, I'm the woohoo lady. Yes. In yeah. the aerobics class, which can be helpful sometimes. Yes, exactly. So I wanted to say, I love this about myself. I love my drive. You know, when yeah. I was living in that sex cult, <laughs> one of the main reasons why I left those communities is because, like, I was just missing people who had ambition, you know, oh, who, okay. wanted, yeah. who wanted to build something bigger in life. I wanted that. So I am not balance. against it. Mm -hmm. Yes. But I will say that th there are moments when like, you just have to stop and listen. I, I always say, just imagine you're speaking to a small child. Yeah. If your child like, you know, is playing with other kids and they fall and, and they're bleeding, right? You're going to be like, oh my God, come, let me like take care of you. You're not like, oh, stop crying and go have fun with others, right? It's like, yeah. you, you you recognize there's time to just be nurturing. And you recognize so there's pain there. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you, you don't push through all of this. You have to also know when it's like, okay, it's just time to embrace and tell you that everything is going to be fine. Yes. Like, let's just slow down. Let's lower our voices. Let's have some hugs, maybe some tea. Yes. All of those things. And, and I had, that was hard earned wisdom for me because I fought that. I just felt like it was weak and boring and, and not how I did things, but well, the universe was like, okay, <laughs> well, you're going to crash and burn girl. You'll learn. <laughs> um, I have loved this conversation so much, Magda. I, I do want to, before we, before we go, is there anything that you want to circle back to that we talked about that you want to make sure that you either, um, you know, underscore or add to the conversation before we we were complete? I'd like to give your listeners to specific techniques. Cause I know okay. we spoke a yes. lot about like mindset and attitude and it's not very tangible. So I want to give you guys two tangible things to be able to really like get to those tantric orgasmic states. So there's a few secrets to Tantra. One of them is eye gazing. Mm. So it's about looking into the eyes of the other person. And it's very difficult. You'll notice it's very uncomfortable. We have a tendency of looking around or at least or giggling. Mm. Yes, or giggling. I'm a giggler. So try to just look into the other person's eyes, ideally for about 10 minutes. Challenge yourself to do time. it in the bedroom. It is, I know, I know. I mean, I've done this for like even 30 minutes or so. Just during sex, I know that when you close your eyes, you go kind of deeper into your body. Yeah, that's but what I But you're do. actually disconnecting from your partner. So mm -hmm. try keeping your eyes open, looking at them. And maybe it will be more difficult for you to reach your pleasure, but you will have this deep, intimate connection with your partner. So that will be the first thing I really recommend. Mm -hmm. And the second one is change how you breathe. Breath is the easiest way to put yourself in those orgasmic states, but it has to be deep breath through the mouth in and out through the mouth. Now, I know you guys are just listening, but just listen to my, to my breath. Now it goes like this. <gasps> ah. 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 
As in like to to have that sound, it really needs to be deep. So it's not that you just kind of like open your lips a little bit and kind (laughs) of just take some or in. It has to be the kind of breath that kind of makes you dizzy. Okay. And you break through it. And when you feel like I'm tired, I don't want it anymore. You keep going through that point because exactly on the other side of that tiredness is magic. Yeah. Try again doing this during sex. So these are the two tips for you guys that I just wanted to share. (laughs) I'm so glad. Thank you so much for that. I, we all love a, a good tangible exercise. So where can people go to learn more about you? You guys can search for Magda K. It's K-A-Y. And I always tell people there's pretty much two Magda K's on online. One is a DJ. I am not a DJ. <laughs> okay, not a DJ. <laughs> so pretty much anything else you're going to find is going to be me. But yes, you can go to magdak.com, Instagram, Magda K, uh, YouTube. This is where I'm very active because okay. Instagram loves to uh, shadow banning me and YouTube seems to like me. So there's more content on YouTube. Again, just look for Magda K. Um, there's a lots and lots of content for free. Okay, yeah. The, the link will be in the show notes and it's M-A-G-D-A-K-A-Y, everyone. Thank you again for being here. And listeners, thank you so much for your time. You know how much I appreciate it. Your time is incredibly valuable. I do not take that for granted. And remember, it's our life's purpose to make ourselves better humans and our life's responsibility to make the world a better place. Bye for now. Hey, did you know there's free secret podcast episodes waiting for you that are not part of my regular podcast feed? Yes, andreaowen.com slash free. And you just sign up. You get a link sent to you. It's very secret. It's like a secret club. We don't have a secret handshake. Don't worry about that. But it's these motivating podcast episodes that I made for you. They're under 20 minutes each. There's three of them. They're for wherever you are in your life. So head on over there and grab them. They range from really supporting you and seeing you where you are and being compassionate all the way to giving you a giant kick in your ass and telling you how amazing and gorgeous and phenomenal you are. So andreaowen.com slash free and get your hands on that free podcast feed. Are you a parent in need of a laugh and a little escape? Look no further. Parenting is a Joke is the podcast you've been waiting for. Hey, I'm Ophira Eisenberg. I'm a stand-up comic and parent. And each week I chat with one of my top comedian pals who, just like you, are juggling careers, busy lives and schedules, and raising a family. You can expect candid stories, hilarious mishaps that happen on stage and at home, and just a lot of laughs. There's no expert advice here. Well, actually, sometimes a good idea does sneak its way in, but mostly just pure, relatable fun to remind you that we're all in this parenting adventure together. New episodes of Parenting is a Joke drop every Tuesday, so tune in, get ready to laugh, unwind, and maybe even feel a little bit better about your own parenting. Because sometimes that's exactly what your therapist, pediatrician, and bartender ordered. (laughs) Subscribe now on your favorite podcast platform.